Okay, I'm happy to uh, invite the almost last lecturer for, lecturer for today, Mr. Jasper Visa from the Netherlands. Jasper specializes in the development of accessible content through advanced technologies. He consults organizations that wish to develop content and distribute their product value through digital means. Jasper calls himself a change agent, and as such, he identifies gaps of information and communication. He formulates future strategies, works for mediation and creating a dialogue. He, works with European he worked with the European Parliament, the, Nation the National Library of South Wales, and the Philips Company. Jasper has his own blog, The Future Museum, and his curious motto says that he is inspired by coffee. Coffee break, by the way, is immediately after your lecture. So hopefully we will be inspired then. Jasper, welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, so sorry to be in between you and the coffee. Um, we'll have to make do. I don't see you. Can we, can we get some more light in the room, please? I want to see the people I'm, I'm talking to. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. All right, um, great. Um, I'm going slightly off script, sorry, uh, translators, uh, because I wanted to show this photo after, after James this morning. Um, this is my favorite, this, this went viral on Twitter and, and Facebook a while back. And, and what I want you to do throughout this presentation is either get your phone and Google what is going on, you'll be able to find it, or to formulate some sort of idea or opinion what these, these um, youngsters are doing in front of the Nightwatch with Sai, as being from Holland, can say is the most beautiful painting ever made. Um, just think about it. At the end, the very end, I'll come back to, to what is going on here, and I'll, I'll hopefully dispel one uh, truth that, that James mentioned earlier this morning. Uh, I can already hint, I think this is amazing, uh, and not at all a risk. So, um, the reason I'm here is because a couple of years ago I compared visiting a museum to going to the dentist. It, stop. It both happens about once a year and if you're unlucky, you're stuck for hours. Um, all jokes aside, I think there are comparisons and, and not too long ago I actually worked for a company that tries to get more people to visit the dentist. So what I'd like to do to start off just is explore about ways, how do we get people to go to the dentist. Well, the one we're most familiar with is to scare people to the dentist. <laughs> Brush your teeth or they'll rot out and you'll, for the rest of your life, feel miserable. Um, brilliant technique. We know it. We can translate it to museums. If you don't visit, you'll lose out on all these beautiful things in life. Um, but of course, what happens is we make the dentist scary. Not a good technique. Uh, the next one, a favorite of my old dentist, was to make the dentist a bit more fun. So this is Mr. Bean. We remember Mr. Bean, I guess. My dentist's idea of fun was to show Mr. Bean all the time. Um, did that make the dentist more fun? No. Kept the dentist just as scary, but it just added a little bit of Mr. Beanie yes to the situation. Um, so, of course, what is, option, what is the third option? The option uh, I think is, is, is the most relevant one is to make a meaningful connection between going to the dentist and people's ordinary uh, lives. So we have to figure out what motivates people, what drives them to visit the dentist, why don't they go to the dentist, and how can we make going to the dentist more of a, an everyday part of people's uh, life. The company I worked with, they did it with a game making a game that teaches healthy brushing habits uh, to, to trick people to go to the dentist. My own current dentist does it uh, very well, I think. I'm terribly afraid of the dentist. I used to be terribly afraid of the dentist. If you know any of you would say, you're going to the dentist after the talk, I would filibuster this whole meeting until we all fell asleep. Um, but what she did is she connected with me on a personal level. She relates to the things I care about, to the things I, I think about, and she makes a real meaningful connection with me, with as a result I'm slightly less frightened of the dentist, but I think that'll change once my teeth really start to go getting bad. So what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes or so with you is see if, if a visit to a museum is like a visit to the dentist, how can we get people to visit a museum and especially um, focus on uh, how can we, these people, our audiences, focus on our audiences, 
what motivates what motivates them, what drives them, and and how can we get them to go to a museum? Because I think there are a lot of similarities between the dentist and the museum. What does drive our audience? What motivates them? And especially, how is this changing because of all the changes we see in society? Uh, before we dive in there, let's talk a little bit about uh, generations. I will not ask you to raise your hand, um, but when I look around, I see some people who belong to this wonderful generation called Generation X. You can raise your hand in yourself, so you don't have to <laughs> shout it out there. Um, I think Generation X, which I will use as the baseline for this talk, is a wonderful generation. It's the last non-digital generation. Um, yeah, that's, that's actually a beautiful thing. <laughs> you're the last people to whom a museum is actually something you can relate to. No. Um, you're uh, uh, born somewhere between the 1965 and 1980s of the last century. Uh, you're a very wonderful uh, generation, and a generation we understand very well. Why? Because it's the dominant generation in most societies today. It's the ones that make policy, it's the ones that fund our museums, they're a big group of the people who come to our museums, they're a generation we feel comfortable with. Um, I will not make all the jokes I can make, but I'll tell you what comes next. And this is the generation I'm part of, and uh, I'll already give a little hint, um, millennials, or the generation Y, born anywhere between 1980 and something like the 2000s of the last century, um, they're the most narcissistic generation ever to be born. And we also happen to be the best generation ever born. Um, we, are, we are also a very special generation in the sense that we were born in a non-digital world, but raised in a digital world. So whereas I and, and people of my generation, who I also see here, can relate to not having a cell phone, we don't really understand how people did that, how they actually lived without a cell phone. You know, how did you go on a date before there was Tinder? Completely odd. Um, so millennials, or Generation Y, they're the same thing. They're a very important generation. Why? In, and I've put it down there in 2030, in a couple of years' time, they will be what Generation X is right now. They're the new dominant force in society. Already in a lot of countries, and, and when I looked at the statistics, Israel may well be one of these countries, they make up the dominant force in the uh, labor force. They, they're the, really the next generation, so it's important to keep them in mind. Um, the last generation I want to talk about in this talk is Generation Z, or the babies at the moment. Um, they're also called digital natives. They're the first truly digital generation ever to have lived. And although they're still young, the first ones are entering the labor market at the moment. Um, they're coming to our museums and they're, as educator, uh, educators, they're our audience, our primary audience, uh, probably. Um, fortunately for me, being a millennial, um, Generation Z looks a lot like me. There's some differences, we'll, we'll focus on them. Um, unfortunately for Generation X and the ones coming before that, the boomers and the silent generation and all of them, uh, these new people are kind of kind of strange, they're kind of really different from all of us. So what, what's, why are they different? There are a lot of reasons, but I'd like to focus, as it's my main, my main sort of like um, uh, specialty, is a digital revolution. Um, it's a slow revolution, although the first signs of the digital revolution started over 100 years ago, and the internet has been around for at least uh, 50 years. Somewhere in the past 10 to 15 years, um, at least developed countries transformed from a traditional or analog society into a fully digital um, society. Currently, worldwide, there are about 3 billion people on the internet and about 7 billion phone subscriptions, uh, which means it is, and I, I always make this joke, so if you've heard it before, just laugh out of sort of like courtesy. Um, there's more cell phone subscriptions in the world than toothbrushes. It's more likely somebody owns a phone than a toothbrush. Um, it also, and this is something I heard last week, 90% uh, of the people take their phones to the toilet. Um, and Somebody told me, and I don't know if this is true, so this may just be a good story for Twitter, but not a really good story for um, an academic audience, is that because of that, cell phones are one of the places where new species are born, new types of bacteria, <laughs> that because they exchange hands so often, with all the bacteria on it, they form, I don't know. <laughs> what I do know is that, is that this digital revolution has, has 
had an enormous impact uh, on the way we live our lives. This is just some examples. Um, and I've highlighted only one, one I think we're all uh, either worried about or, or, or super excited about, uh, and that's the automation of, of knowledge work. Just to give an example of the impact of the information and te uh, communication technologies on our society. Knowledge work is the work we do, you know? We're used to um, factory work being automated, and we maybe kind of laugh about people who still do, you know, factory work, but um, we, we feel comfortable in our knowledge jobs, in our intellectual work. Uh, unfortunately, that's being replaced at an enormous speed by computers. The Polytechnic Museum in Moscow has trained robots to do tours. Um, and, and I guess we've all heard the story of, of IBM Watson's supercomputer who won the, the game show Jeopardy in 2010, beating its human uh, uh, competition. This is a computer so powerful that it understands questions posed in human language, but then can use the world's fastest algorithms and, and all the knowledge on the internet to answer them. And humans are no, no competition for that anymore. Um, some of these changes are are good, some of them are bad. I'm not here to discuss the nature of the changes or engage in a debate about whether it's good or not that the world is changing, it is. Um, if you want to, we can do that afterwards. But it, it's mainly important to realize that this digital revolution has radically changed how we interact with each other. Um, it's not just technology, by the way. As we've heard before this morning, there's things like the financial crises, uh, there's things like climate change, um, that really impact the way people, um, the different generations behave. But primarily, I think it's, it's a technology uh, change. So, what has changed? Um, a lot. And I'd like to focus with you on, on just three topics. Not all topics. I think we can talk for hours and hours and hours and hours about what has changed. I want to focus on three that are uh, mainly uh, important for our work as museum educators. And they're communication, attitude, and education. So, let's go. Uh, communication. Information and communication technologies, ICTs, of course, change the way we communicate um, with each other. Just to give you some statistics, 2.6 uh, billion people use email in the world. Um, they send about 200 billion emails every single day. Uh, 1.4 billion people are on Facebook, and in the last month alone, over 800 million people used WhatsApp. These are incredibly big numbers. Um, and they're only going to grow. The platforms will change, but the, but the, the, the numbers um, grow. This has an incredible impact on, on a lot of the traditional media. Uh, reading books is down by 25% in the UK. Um, unless, and this is a thing I like, unless you happen to read a lot of books, the group of people who reads more than 20 books per year is growing. So there's going to be some sort of new literary divide where you either have people who read Tons of books, and those who don't read at all. Newspaper reading is down. Uh, almost every form of traditional media, apart from television, is down. Television and digital media are the only media that are on the rise in terms of consumption. Uh, and a common thing to assume, especially if you're from Generation X, is that millennials and Gen Z, young people, love their digital communication. You know, we, we see them sitting in the Rijksmuseum or in the Marriott's house with their phones, and we feel this is a generation that only wants to communicate through digital media. Unfortunately, that's as wrong as you can uh, be. In fact, uh, Generation Y, Millennials, and Generation Z, if you look at statistics, and I'll blog about these so you can find the sources after my uh, talk, um, are more likely than the generations before them to prefer face-to-face -face communication to digital communication. Only 19% of them prefers email to other communication, only 14% prefers uh, messaging, so WhatsApp and, or iMessage, to face-to-face -face, uh, communication. Although 6, uh, 96%, 69%, sorry, numbers, will say that they can't live for an hour without their cell phone. When it comes to it, in the workplace, in their schools, everywhere, they will prefer face-to-face -face communication. Um, I think one of the reasons for that, or, or, or what is happening, is that especially if you look at Gen Z, they will not talk about digital communication. To them, digital, unlike the Gen Xers, the older generations, is just communication. Um, 
What they want is they want to have communication. They won't talk about digital. You will not hear somebody under 25 ever mention the word, word uh, digital. They want communication. And the communication they want has changed, but they prefer it uh, physical. So what has changed? Well, they want their communication to be immediate. So they're not waiting for three hours or three weeks or three months to, uh, for you to reply to a letter. Um, they want it to be opt-in, which is the reason why people are moving to WhatsApp. Because if WhatsApp, you can always ignore. You can say, I didn't read it, which is why the two blue little arrows, they're about the worst. <laughs> they're about, we, who's had trouble with the two, two blue arrows in their lives? Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a niece who um, turns off the router um, before she reads her WhatsApp, so the other people don't know that she's read it. <laughs> and then she turns it back on once they are allowed to know. Anyway, different story. Um, they want it to be opt-in. They want it to be personal and private, uh, which is the result of, of Snapchat. You know, the, the service where you send a photo for only 15 seconds or 7 seconds is so incredibly popular. Um, a raise of hands. Who's on Facebook? Yeah, yeah. So that's why new generations aren't on Facebook anymore. We're boring to them, so they leave the platform in flux. Sorry about that. I'm on Facebook as well, I'm boring as well. Um, and they want it to be unique and inclusive, so they want to be part of a conversation. And what I always, I, I like to call this uh, uh, the campfire feeling. That is, if, even if we're in a living in a truly digital world, people prefer to have physical experiences. And this was mentioned before this morning, uh, James, when you opened your talk, you said museums are about real experiences, real objects, real physical stuff. It's also why you're here. You could just as well have watched this on Periscope from the comfort of your uh, office while you checked your email, drank a coffee, uh, which would have been just as easy. Um, so, and, and this, I should have told you this, we'll do this afterwards. Um, I wanted to show this to counter uh, James. Phones can actually be used uh, to make these personal connections. I'll talk about this uh, after the break. This is the Dutch National Ballet. It's a game where you actually dance based on what your cell phone does. It's stunning. Anyone who wants to play it, play it with me afterwards. The second thing that has changed is uh, attitude. Um, of all the generations that are currently alive, Generation Y and Z, Millennials and Gen Z, are the most optimistic people out there. Um, they're the, I call them the can-do generations. They will see, they will know problems, but they'll try to solve them. Yes, we can solve climate change. Yes, we can solve the financial crisis. Yes, we can find new ways for healthcare. Uh, this is a generation that cares a whole lot about social impact. Um, and I don't think it's a surprise that the first, the first president to be elected by a very big millennial uh, uh, um, voters group was a president that has a, as a motto exactly this optimist message. Yes, we can uh, make changes. Sip of water. A great example of this, I think, is, a, is I love this case. It's a, a Teatro Sociale de Gualcheri. Um, in the 80s of the last century, this theater closed for renovation works, but never reopened. And in 2006, a group of young people, they decided that their place, Gualcheri, needed a theater. So what they did is they strung their hands together and they started uh, uh, renovating the, the, the theater, while at the same time programming theater performances and creating new performances and reopening uh, the theater. In the end, it, um, they managed to reopen it, and, but they didn't ask for permission from the government. The government only came in after years and years and years and they started to contribute some money, but they mostly run this themselves. They didn't wait for government to come and fix it. They said, yes, we can fix our uh, local theater. Uh, a wonderful example, a wonderful um, uh, 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 little statistics from this is from Colleen Dillon Schneider, who generously shares uh, stats about museum visitors on our blog, and I think this is, this is a very good uh, case in point for, for what people care about. Um, why do you become a member of a, of a cultural institution? Gen X and older, the older people, free admission. Well, everybody cares about free admission, but they want all the exclusive membership perks. So they want priority access, mem members only functions, all the elite stuff that we, you know, we like to have as a member. Why do young people become a member of a of a cultural institution to support it, to 
have a positive impact on it to 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 support conservation all these sort of like bigger social yes we can uh, goals and in fact in in 2014 the uh, American uh, uh, Museum Association and their Center for the Future of Museums gave out a pretty clear warning call you don't have to read it it's about be a yes you can institution or die um, something like that Generation Y and Z want their institutions want to have social impact themselves because they believe they can change the world and they want the organizations they work with to change the world. If they don't, they don't um, care. Last little point, this is the point you're most familiar with because this is the point of education um, and it's, it's actually um, fairly easy what's happening with education. Currently in a lot of countries more than half of the population has a bachelor's uh, degree. Millennials will hold a bachelor's degree. Um, more than the European Union has as uh, its official target that more than at any given moment in time, anyone, more than 50% of the population needs to be engaged in lifelong learning. Countries like the Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands and Germany and the UK and Ireland uh, are already surpassing this number. Which means that at any given moment, one out of six or seven people will be engaged in some sort of formal learning, even if they're 65 years uh, old. Our next visitors will be the most highly educated visitors we'll ever see, and they'll expect more than ever to learn from any experience they uh, find. And my favorite one, and we saw this to, this morning, but I wanted to show off a little bit, is of course these massive online open courses that we have. And I, the only thing I wanted to show is that uh, last year I did one from the University of Tel Aviv and I scored a um, distinction. Um, I paid some money to get a very nice certificate and now I know everything about the history of the modern Middle East. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that, wasn't, that was definitely not necessary. <laughs> Uh, so as I already said this, they will be the best educated visitors we will ever see and they will expect to learn and develop themselves whenever they interact with anything. If you ask millennials why they pick a job, they will pick it for their career perspectives. Not because of the money, well millennials a little bit, older millennials care a lot about money, younger ones don't. They will want to have an impact. If you ask Gen Z why they pick a job, they pick a job because it has a social impact. It improves the world. Uh, and they don't care about anything. Well, they care about other things, but that's, that's super important to them. So let's go back to the, the museum visitor of tomorrow. Who are these people that are coming through our doors in, in maybe five or 10 or 15 years time or who are already coming in, through our doors right now? And I think I added this slide um, earlier this uh, morning. Uh, after, after I heard in each of the talks about participation being participation being a key, and it's true. Kevin Aloka is, is a guy who watches YouTube videos for a living, and in 2011 or so, he uh, figured out what makes a YouTube video succeed, and what makes it fail, and he figured out that if you look at the, the culture of YouTube, sort of like the video, the visual arts uh, uh, culture, what's most important is tastemakers, creative participating communities and complete unexpectedness. And if I translate this to culture or to museums, the complete unexpectedness are real objects, real stories, real experiences. Um, the tastemakers are, are the new authority, the people that have a voice that people listen to. But most importantly, it's about these creative participating communities. And I'm very happy to, to sit there during the day and see all these examples of, of participatory uh, practice. With one little, and I, I also added this one to just be a little bit nagging, um, where it's very important that if you deal with these audiences, you make a distinction between participation and interactivity. Where participation is, a, is, a, is an expression of a culture, a, a museum culture, and interactivity is an expression of uh, a technology. So interactivity is adding a button to an exhibit, whereas participation is having people design the exhibit. So who is this museum visitor of the uh, future? Well, they're highly educated, interested in learning, they're socially uh, very social, and they're anxious to contribute to the uh, world. They're well connected, but not afraid for the face-to-face -face communication. And like me, they may be slightly narcissistic and, and a little bit nervous, uh, but we're 
kind of cool. Um, and I want to just give you two examples. You may know these people. This is the Museum Visitor of the Future. On the left, you see Jack and Rekka. Uh, when he was 14 years old, he invented a new way to uh, identify all sorts of cancer um, using the internet and a local uh, science center as his sources of information. He's world famous by now. He's definitely narcissistic, but he's a great guy. Um, and Makasinski, uh, similarly, in her teens, developed together with her father a flashlight that doesn't need batteries. It uses the energy from your uh, body to give a light. She developed this, again, using the knowledge of the internet uh, and knowledge elsewhere to, to create this a really big innovation. Both of them did this in their teens. They're the, they're the next generation. And I think when I talk to the next generation elsewhere, maybe they won't work on cancer or flashlights, but they will be willing to contribute in this way to uh, uh, society. They're very real. These young people, they're very real. And, and my guess is that when they visit us, when they visit our museums, um, they will not just visit us, but they will want to transform us. They will want to work with the stuff we have on display and change us for the better, using their optimism and their extreme knowledge and their extreme care, either whether we allow them or not. In the, in the lunch I spoke with, it's somebody about in Germany where, where people are making their own tours based on a museum exhibition without the museum's permission. These people, they do this. They, you can't stop them. Um, so I want to close off with a story, I think my favorite museum story of the past decade, um, the transformation process of the Derby Silk Mill. And where I usually talk about how they used community participation and all these elements to really involve and engage their audiences and, and uh, um, uh, get them to rebuild this museum from the ground off. Now I wanna, I wanna just only look at this photo. And what you see here is, you see Generation X, maybe you see even on the, you know, the balding people may even be uh, baby boomers. Um, you see in the back, you see some millennials. And, and you see in, in, the, in the center there, the, the, the boy center states, he's probably a generation set, right? He's very young still. Um, together, they're redeveloping the Derby Silk Mill. Uh, they're redef redefining what this museum means for their community and the way it can add value to their community. Uh, and, and this makes me very, very optimistic because I believe that in these changing audiences, if we as museums stay true to these real objects, real experiences and real uh, uh, stories, we can actually use all these different generations and the way they change and the energy and the optimism they bring to the table to uh, stay relevant for uh, a very long time. Now, and now I want to go back to this, I, I didn't end, edit at the end, so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly scroll back to the beginning. But now I want to ask you, if you, if you listen to all of this, what do you think these people are doing? What do you think these kids are doing? Anyone an idea what they're doing? They could very well be sharing their ideas. Yes, that, that could be a thing they're doing. So, some, some older ideas. What, what are these kids doing? They're talking to each other. Uh, I don't, maybe to their friends at home or to their, to their families and parents. Could, could be. Sorry? They're Facebooking with their friends that they're there. Let, think, what, what are they doing? What are they doing? Anyone Google it? Did you Google it? Reading on Wikipedia? Probably they're doing it. Yeah, yes, probably. Show the Sorry? They show the what they're doing is actually, and that's the funny thing, they're doing an educational program of the Rijksmuseum. Uh, at least that's what I've been told. Maybe this is defense by the Rijksmuseum that they're like, no, 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 they're doing an education program. What I've heard is these kids are interacting with their phones only because they're told to do so in the Rijksmuseum. And anyone who's been to the Rijksmuseum will know that if you stand in front of the, the night watch, people only take pictures. Sorry? No, no, you're allowed to use phones in the Rijksmuseum. You most definitely are allowed to use, use phones. Um, you only use phones to do the, 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 the I've been here to check the, to check the box, but people will use paper, friends, and other things to talk about the experience, much like we've heard the entire day. So these are not annoyed, distracted, naughty, Generation Zs who we need to force and scare into appreciating our art. These are really nicely engaged people that uh, I can't wait to see much more in our uh, museums. Thank you very much.